Okay, so we are on to chapter 10. Uh, Greece is really a two chapter unit, so it's big, so we're halfway through, which actually went pretty fast. Um, okay, so this is now, we're calling this the Greek world um, in the second part. So now we're doing 550 to 30 BC. So marching very close to the birth of Christ, uh, marching very close to AD. Okay. We have some beautiful ruins here, and we've got the world events. Um, we're actually going to be talking about Persia, and that's Cyrus the Great here. And then, so that's happening right around the same time as Confucius being born in China. And I know you guys remember Confucius. Here is the Acropolis, the Parthenon in Athens. It was a temple built to Athena. We'll talk about that, too. This always cracks me up, this old school TV. Kind of shows how old this um, textbook is. Okay. Um, and we're going to learn that ancient Greeks were fierce fighters and great builders. A lot of this chapter is conflict. Conflict with outside forces, Persia and Macedonia, and then conflict within itself, uh, Sparta versus Athens, two city-states within Greece. So it's a lot of action. Um, so we'll talk about the Peloponnesian War. Talk about Alexander the Great conquering Greece and conquering a lot more than that. He's Macedonian. And then we'll see Rome conquering everything, which is the end of the Greek Empire at that time. And then we'll move on to Rome. Uh, but we see the different things that are happening at the same time. Maccabees, remember when we were doing Judaism? Marian Empire founded in 325, right around the time that Alexander the Great is building his empire. And the last Egyptian ruler of Egypt is overthrown uh, before it falls. And so this is when Greece is still really building up some steam. And e Egypt is already kind of done in that ancient um, domination. So here we go. We are starting here on page, according to my book, 286. So what's really interesting about this unit is the first section is all about Persia. And Persia is a totally different area of the map um, than... Greece, but, uh, but um, they had a really interesting relationship with one another. So that's why Persia is included within the Greece chapter. Persia could really be its own chapter. Maybe if I were writing this history book, I would have Persia be its own chapter, and its own section, because it's a fascinating empire. Um, but that's not the way the book did it. So this goes inside it. So it's almost like a unit within a unit. So over the next couple videos, we're going to talk just about Persia. So the main ideas are Persia became an empire under Cyrus the Great. After he dies, we have Persia, Persian Empire growing under Darius the First. And then becomes now here's the relevant part for Greece. The Persians fight Greece twice in wars that are now called the Persian Wars. Okay. The big idea is over time the Persians came to rule a great empire, which eventually brought them into conflict with the Greeks, which makes sense because they were two big powers at the time. So let's get started. Um, in your notes, actually, um, I will show you a map of Persia if I don't have one. Oh, here we go. Uh, Persian Empire. So here we are, we're talking about Greece. Way over here, it looks so small. This is sort of a spoiler because the Persian Empire gets really large. Um, but when we talk about Persia today, it's right here, and Persia today is known, does anyone know, as Iran. Um, a lot of people in LA know that because we, there's a huge Persian population in Los Angeles. Um, so that means that um, at some point, um, the, the Iranian people um, were from Persia, well, back, back when uh, Iran was known as Persia, um, that's where we get that name, Persian, uh, or maybe Iranian, uh, but Persian people, or Iranian people are ancient Persians, right, is, is where that comes from. There you go. So that's the old name. All right, let's go back up. Eventually it gets huge, right, but this is as when it's starting out, okay? So, um, while the Athenians were taking the first steps toward creating a democracy, a new power was rising in the east, so huge things are happening here in Athens. We got a democracy, we got all sorts of other city-states happening, and yet while this is happening, 
the Persians are becoming a really important and powerful group to reckon with. And eventually, even though they're very far apart, they will, will conflict with each other because they might look far apart. But as they expand, now this is Turkey. Turkey and Greece are very close to each other. Um, this power, the Persian Empire, would one day attack Greece. But early in their history, the Persians were an unorganized nomadic people, meaning traveling place to place. Took the skills of leaders like Cyrus the Great and Darius the First to change the situation. Under these leaders, the Persians created a huge empire, one of the mightiest of the ancient world. And it was the largest until Alexander the Great's empire. And that was the largest until the Roman Empire. And then that was the largest. So even though we'd say, oh, it wasn't as big as others. Well, it was the biggest at the time, right? It wasn't until later that other, others eclipsed it. So let's take some notes about Cyrus. Some things you can write about Persia, that it's in modern-day Iran, um, that it was far away from Greece, uh, and yet it was starting to gain power. All right, so now we can take some notes about Cyrus the Great. Persians often fought other peoples in Southwest Asia. Sometimes they lost. In fact, they lost a fight to a people called the Medes and were ruled by them for about 150 years. So that's you know, this occupied group that eventually needs to be overthrown and that kind of kicks off Persian dominance. In 550 BC, Cyrus II, later known as Cyrus the Great, is able to do that. He leads a Persian revolt against the Medes. It's successful. And now we have an independent Persia. So that, in your notes, you should say, that's what kind of kicks off this Persian dominance. They, they have this great leader, Cyrus II, later known as Cyrus the Great, and he overthrows the Medes. And that's usually what historians say marks the beginning of the Persian Empire. So a very important event. All right, so here we go. Here's some more things you can write about him. One reason Cyrus the Great was so successful as an emperor was the way he treated conquered people. He didn't force people to adopt Persian customs, and he didn't mistreat them. So you have other, you know, conquerors that say, now you need to adopt our religion, you need to take on our customs, you need to do this and that. Cyrus the Great, and, and we actually talked about him when we talked about the Jewish people being enslaved. He freed the Jewish people, oh, it does say it right here, uh, from the Babylonians. He didn't want them enslaved on his watch. When he took over Babylon, that meant he already also took over the Jewish people who are under his rule now. He didn't want that, right? He had them return to their homeland. He told them they could worship their own gods. So he was called the great because he did great things, uh, like expand and start this empire, but because he was known as a person who allowed people to maintain their beliefs. So it's a really important thing to jot down about him. Uh, because of these, Babylonians and Jews alike had great respect for Cyrus. As you can see on the map, Cyrus conquered much of Southwest Asia, including nearly all of Asia Minor during his rule. So Persia under Cyrus, this is, Okay, the dark purple, he is starting the empire during his rule. All this light purple area, huge, huge. Hindu Kush, that means we're getting to Egypt. I'm sorry, India. Uh, most of Mesopotamia connecting almost to Egypt, and it's not for Cambyses is the one who does that, right? But a really significant expansion, arguably the most significant expansion. So you can add that. Included in this region were several Greek cities that Cyrus took over. Now, not mainland Greek cities, but Greek what? Colonies. So took over Greek colonies. That's what kind of starts this trouble brewing that will take a, lot, a long time for it actually to turn into a war. But that's what gets things started. The Greeks themselves are not captured, but their colonies that they've established around the Mediterranean are. And so that's like an indirect conquering of Greece, even though it's not on Greek land yet. Okay, if you need me to say that again, rewind me and play it again, because that's a really important thing to understand and to have in your notes. He also landed to the east. Oh, it says here, he then marched south to conquer Mesopotamia. He also added land to the east. He led his army into Central Asia, into, I've never known him, Jakartes River, which we now call the Sir Daria. When he died around 529 BC, Cyrus ruled the largest empire the world had ever seen. Add that. Now it's not, now it's not because we've lived longer than that. But at the time, 
he died, the ruler of the largest empire the world had seen. Wow! Incredible. Cyrus let people he conquered keep their own customs, as we said. He hoped this would make them less likely to rebel. He was right. No one likes a conqueror who makes them change their ways and is harsh and cruel. It just makes people want to revolt. Um, so his strategy was a wise one. And a compassionate one. And a tolerant one, which is not usually what we say when we talk about the ancient world at all. Few people rebelled against Cyrus, and his empire remained strong. Because of his great successes, historians, not people who lived during his time period, but historians eventually called him Cyrus the Great. Cool. So here's what's really interesting. Um, he, and we haven't really talked about this before, and we'll talk about a lot more like strategy and in like army formations in the next um, several videos with Persia, with, with Greece, with Rome, of course, uh, with Macedonia. What's more strategy with how do you organize an army and how do you how do you fight your enemy and how can you use geography to your advantage? All that stuff becomes really irrelevant in these next few videos. Cyrus was successful in his conquest because his army was strong. It was strong because it was well organized and loyal. So here we are. This is going to be Darius the first. Okay. At the heart of the Persian army were immortals. So write this down under the immortals. And if I don't have it there, just write down who they are under the Persian army. They were 10,000 soldiers chosen for their bravery and skill. So, of course, they weren't actually immortal. Immortal means that you cannot die. Okay, of course, that's not the case. But they called them that because they were extremely brave, extremely skilled. It was the best, the brightest. Okay, so that was one group in the army. So write that down in your notes. In addition to the immortals, the army had a powerful cavalry, not to be confused with cavalry, the name of our school. Cavalry, so this is the second part of the army, is a unit of soldiers who ride horses or soldiers on horseback, okay? That is called a cavalry. Think back to um, the terracotta warriors. Some of them were cavalry, right? He had some on feet, uh, on foot, soldiers, and some of them were on horses, so that was cavalry. So that's his um second part right so here's now how he uses these two together so he would start out with the cavalry to charge at and shoot an enemy with arrows that weakens the enemy and then the really strong really skilled really brave really brutal immortals would come and kind of finish the job so this is kind of the first time like i said we've talked about a real strategy cavalry first to wipe out as many people and to weaken and then the immortal swept in second, and the result was they could defeat almost any foe. Foe means enemy. Okay, there was the strategy. All right, so now we'll learn about the next one. So Cyrus had a son who's named Cambyses. He expanded, as we saw, into Egypt, which is a big deal, and that was it. And then Darius spreads into Greece and north of Greece and spreads a little further into India. Okay, so we're going to learn about those people. Um, so he took over, for example, he conquered Egypt and added to the empire. Soon afterward, though, a rebellion broke out in Persia. During this rebellion, Cambyses died. His death left Persia without a clear leader because he was still pretty young. He didn't have an obvious heir. So now we have someone who's not uh, in the direct line. Who becomes king next, Darius the first. Not Darius, I know that's what it looks like, but look, Darius. So he claims the throne, kills his rival for power. That'll kind of ensure you the throne. Once he was securely in control, Darius worked to restore order in Persia. He also improved Persian society and expanded the empire. We will talk about how he does that in our next video, but I just want to focus on this image here. Here he is sitting on a throne, much higher than the man who he's talking to. Um, and it says, you know, why do that? Well, you know, it's because he's supposed to be more powerful and, and stronger, just like we've talked about in art. So he restored order to the Persian Empire and expanded it. His army included royal guards, like the two shown here. Here are two of those royal guards we'll talk about later. Add some details about Darius to your notes, and we'll continue with how he organized Persia in our next video.